I decided less than 15 minutes into Porco Rosso that it would be one of my all-time favorite Studio Ghibli films. The sequence that did it for me is the second sequence of the movie. Immediately after Porco saves some schoolgirls from some very silly pirates. The film intercuts a sequence of Porco flying in amidst the golden sunlight between two layers of clouds with a sequence in the restaurant that he is flying to. There, the singer Gina entrances a crowd by singing in French. I love this sequence because it conveys so much while outwardly saying so little. Before, we know that Porco Rosso is alone and a bit bitter, but nonetheless good-hearted. He chooses to let the pirates keep some of the gold they stole in order to repair their plane if they stand down, and even when they refuse his offer, he decides to not shoot them down, even though he very well could have. So we know he's kinder than his gruff exterior suggests, but we don't know exactly who he is, or what influences affect him, but this second sequence reveals that. Porco flying through the evening sky conveys pensiveness, loneliness, the passage of time, and a meditation on his own mortality. This is not a soulless bounty hunter. He's searching. But for what? The obvious implication inherent in intercutting these two sequences is that he loves Gina, which he does, though he does not admit it, and though she only admits it in secret. But we also see a transition in time. The broad comedy of the first sequence firmly sets it in the realm of fantasy. The second sequence, however, steeps the film in a very particular period of time, 1920s Italy, after the rise of Mussolini's fascist government and the decline of the age of the Adriatic seaplane bounty hunters. As Porco travels to Gina's, we are traveling through time, becoming immersed in the period that will delight and terrify us throughout the rest of the film. Gina sings in French, a seemingly innocuous act that nonetheless differentiates her from the immensely nationalistic and jingoistic government of Mussolini. This is an exquisitely international film, which fits considering that it is set in Italy, but directed by a Japanese director who was not born until after the time he is depicting. It has been often said that the character of Porco Rosso is the closest analog to Miyazaki himself, the gruff but good-hearted middle-aged man with deeply conflicted feelings about his past. For Miyazaki, it's more of a familial sin, as his family became rich making airplanes for the Japanese military during the Second World War, while for Porco Rosso it is highly personal, but the comparison is nonetheless cogent that the Italian Porco, and not any of Miyazaki's many Japanese characters, is the closest analog to the man himself, is a testament to Miyazaki's internationalism. The nationalistic spirit, Miyazaki suggests, gets in the way of the cooperation and unity that his films constantly suggest is crucial to building a better or at least less cruel world. Other than the fascists, the character the film treats most antagonistically is the silly, bombastic, jingoistic Curtis. I want to note here that the American dub doubles down on the overly bombastic, overt Americanness of Curtis, elevating it to the point of parody, but that streak is very much there in the original Japanese film. So we have the film's subtle internationalism, its ability to transport us to a glamorous, sad, and bygone era, and Porco's yearning, disguised as is by the pain of the war, but very much here in this second sequence in the evening. But also consider this, as we are going back in time, 
transitioning through the sequence. Porco is also going back in time. There is a faint unreality to this first scene at Gina's restaurant. It takes on the feel of a vivid memory, becoming symbolic and capturing the atmosphere of a lost milieu, a forgotten ideal. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not saying that the scene is not really happening in the narrative, and that Porco is just imagining it. That would just be silly. At the risk of coming off as a bit pompous, I'd posit that we film dorks would have a lot better reputation amongst the populace at large if we stopped putting forth these far-fetched conspiracy theories that add nothing to understanding the film as a whole. What I am saying is that this scene evokes the same atmosphere as an F. Scott Fitzgerald book. I'm not just saying this because they take place in the same era, though that is a component of it. What they have in common is that they are both consciously retrospective stories that gaze back in admiration and in a bit of terror at a vivid, almost hyper-real past with the acknowledgement that the story which is being told is about the end of an era. They were eras of freedom and romance and adventure and a lot of tragedy, but they are over. And the reason the story is being told in the past instead of the present is because of that recognition that an era has ended. Also, just as a side note, I highly recommend checking out Fitzgerald's uh, Tender as the Night. If you like The Great Gatsby, or even if you didn't like The Great Gatsby, I really recommend Tender as the Night. It's my favorite Fitzgerald. Anyway, let's look at what's going on here. It's not nostalgia per se. It's a lot more complicated than that. While Porco Rosso is not as cynical as Fitzgerald's work, there's that same juxtaposition between the tragedy and violence and sorrow of an era and the hope that amidst all that, some sort of profound poetic connection can be salvaged. Or if not a connection, at least the fulfillment of an ideal. Gina has already lost three husbands, all of whom were pilots, and one of whom was Porco's close friend. Near the end of the film, when Porco is recounting his experience on that fateful day where he lived and his friend died, to uh, Theo, he sees himself alone at first, only to then see his friend flying beside him. He calls out to him, but his friend does not respond, leaving and ascending to a tunnel of planes high in the sky. In conversation, I've called it plain heaven before, but that's a bit simplistic and blithe. It's not heaven or hell. It is some sort of an afterlife, but it's one that is not entirely separated from our world. From Porco's original position, the collection of planes look like wispy cirrus clouds, and he does not initially recognize the tunnel for what it is. There's a naturalistic tinge to this view of death that makes far more sense in the context of Japanese society. Shinto traditions hold, and I recognize that this is vastly simplifying, as I do not want this video to be like 30 to 40 minutes long. These traditions suggest that everything, regardless of whether we in this modern secular society consider it alive, has a sort of spirit. You might have heard Kami as referring to God, but that's not quite accurate. Even things like rivers and forests and mountains have Kami. You could consider it that as some sort of guardian protector, but that distinction suggests some separation between the thing itself and the spirit, and this distinction does not really exist. It's not like, oh, you have this god guarding that place, and that god guarding some other place. The, the, the places themselves are inextricable from, from the spirit, the kami. 
Anyhow, all of this is connected to the grand uniting energy of the world called Musubi, which you might recognize if you're a Kimi no Nawa fan. Add in Buddhist influences in Japan concerning rebirth and past lives, and you have a much more accurate framework for viewing this scene. As Porco sees his friend, he's treated to a vision of this limbo between life and death. There's an elegiac elegance to this that a more realist angle could not have properly conveyed. In midst of the chaos of World War I, there was something much more random and bizarre and quasi-spiritual about his friend's death than could be conveyed with just simple, non-spiritual facts. This calls to mind how Porco doesn't even know how he survived. The sequence is his subjective, perhaps distorted, recollection of what happened. He and his friend were both stuck in this sort of twilight zone between life and death, which adds extra meaning to the second scene we were talking about before of Porco flying through those two layers of clouds at around twilight. Porco lives, his friend didn't, and he doesn't know why. Earlier in this analysis, I said that just as the film takes us into the past, it takes Porco into his past. I would like to expand on that. Though we do not know exactly what Porco's history with Gina is, the truth is that they have been together for a very long time. They have known each other for a long time. Long before... Porco's friend and her old husband died. He returns to the past when he returns to her, but as we have discussed, that past is tinged with melancholy. What Gina wants is for Porco to meet her in her garden. This is significant as gardens serve as symbols for life and rebirth and purity. It's a chance to start anew, to leave the darkness of the past behind. Porco, it is heavily implied, sees her at the end of the film, after his overcoming his survivor's guilt with Theo's help, allows him to finally turn back into a human. It's a perfect ending to a really profound film, I rest my case. So thank you all for watching, if you liked what you saw today, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Donate to my Patreon if you can and you want to see more videos like this. Watch Porco Rosso again, it's so good. I would not consider it an underrated film necessarily, but it is certainly an underanalyzed film, especially compared to, say, Spirited Away. There's a lot going on here in the subtext that the film really benefits from y'all exploring. It deserves a lot of credit for allowing these somber, ambiguous moments to linger instead of just explaining them. It's so good. <laughs> anyway, tune in soon for my next analysis. It will be coming soon. Promise you that. Thank you all again. Adios, comrades.